Hello and welcome to a new Detective Squirrel Investigates video. In this video we will be looking into the Iranian Embassy Siege. Six days in 1980 that changed Britain and made the SAS heroes of legend. On the last day of April in 1980, PC Trevor Locke was on duty at the Iranian Embassy in Princess Gate in Kensington, London. He was enjoying a cup of tea with the concierge when at 11.30 a.m. six armed men forced entry and within minutes had taken over the embassy. News of the event was muddled at first. BBC's Radio 1 reported that an armed man has forced the policeman outside the Iranian embassy inside, suggesting only one man and also that PC Lock was outside. Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist team C-13, led by John Dello, moved into a nearby building. But before negotiations even start, the leader of the group is heard on the radio, as the BBC managed to speak to them. Their demands are broadcast. They want Arabistan to gain its independence from Iran, and want 91 Arabistani freedom fighters freed from Iranian jail. How they expect the British government to convince the Ayatollah and the Iranian government to agree is a mystery. But what also was a mystery was who were these men and where is this place called Arabistan? Well, what they call Arabistan is in fact in an Iranian province called Khuzestan, which borders Iraq, which leads to the answer of who these men are. They are Iraqis, trained insurgents of Saddam Hussein. John Dello charges DCI Max Vernon with the task of being chief negotiator. The SES at their home base in Hereford are alerted to the incident and they pack up and head out for London. The London, the phone lines for the Iranian embassy are cut and a field telephone is sent in. This creates a situation where the terrorists only contact with the outside world is through the police negotiators. At the same time as supplies are delivered, etc., photos are taken of the terrorists and fingerprints are collected. Meanwhile, the Foreign Office collects information on visas uh, applications from Iraq. Soon the identity of the six men is known. They are led by Own Ali Mohammed, who is known as Salim. His second is Shakir Abdullah Rahil, known as Faisal. Then there is Shakir Sultan Saeed, known as Hassan, Semir Mohammed Hussein, known as Abbas, Fauzi Badazi Nijad, known as Ali, and Maki Hanoun Ali, known as Maki. Since their arrival in England, they have shopped in Harrods, sent their gifts back to their families in Iraq, and paid for the attention of ladies of the night in Soho. This was all thanks to their minder, Sami Mahalid Ali, who was told them that on successful completion of their mission, they were returned home as heroes. Sami lied. Before the group even arrived at the embassy, Sami was on a bat plane bound for Iraq, leaving the six men to their fates. Two other people that were at the embassy that morning following up requests for visas were two BBC employees, Sim Harris, a sound engineer, and Chris Kramer, a producer. Now, anyone who knows anything about the embassy siege are probably aware of the name of Chris Kramer, as he induced himself into sickness, successfully as a ploy to be released. He is, so, he is so successful that it leads him to be taken to hospital, but not before passing on a message from PC Trevor Locke informing authorities of the true number of terrorists 
and the arsenal they are, they are carrying, including grenades. But Chris Kramer was not the first to be released. Almost two hours before his release, at 4.30pm, a press officer called Frida Mozafararian was ill before the siege even began and Selim, believing she was pregnant, let her go. Under the cover of darkness, the SAS move into their Regent's Park barracks. Operation Nimrod is about to begin. During the following day, Trevor Locke, feeling guilty and allowing it all to happen, even though there was nothing he could have done to stop it, Um, he still carries his weapon, fully loaded, after a very brief check from one of the terrorists. But to deal with his guilt, he negotiates with the police outside, with the help of Syrian journalist Mustafa Kouti as a translator. The Iranian foreign minister gives the official response. They will not give in to the terrorist demands. The hostage takers give a deadline of 12 noon. If the demands were not met, they would kill a hostage. This was the time Chris Kramer induced his illness and was released at 11.20am and passed on Trevor Locke's warning to the authorities. Just before 12 noon, the hostages were forced to their knees with their hands behind their backs as guns were ready to execute them deadline passes. No one is killed. The terrorists repeat their demands. Negotiators try to convince them to understand that it's not within the power of the British government to meet these demands. At 3.30am on the following morning, the SAS are moved into number 15 Princess Gate, the Royal College of General Practitioners, next door to the Iranian Embassy. Tiny microphones are dangled down chimneys, also into the walls, small handheld masonry drills are used, but the squeaky noise of the drills are heard by the terrorists. Trevor Locke suggests that it's a mouse, but they have no idea what a mouse is, and insist that if the noise doesn't stop they will kill or kill a hostage. So Cobra, the cabinet office briefing rooms, it's a dull name compared to actually just Cobra. Um, they use the, their extensive contact list. Aircraft are flown low over the area. Construction begins on, well, nothing. And ambulances are diverted, all to cause more noise to cover the sound of the drills. The SAS are given details and photos of the terrorists and the building layout. A plan is devised but they sit at standby. They would not be given the order to go in unless the terrorists kill a hostage. May 3rd. The SAS relax watching the Embassy World Snooker Championship. Trevor Locke and Mustafa Kakuti convince the hostages to hostage takers that the best outcome is for them to surrender. Through Max Vernon and the police negotiators, they agree that BBC Radio will broadcast a statement from the terrorists. That evening, Max Vernon listens to the news on Radio 1. At the end of the news, they mention that a statement had been given to the BBC, but didn't read it. Max Vernon is horrified. He's convinced that a hostage is going to be killed. The phone rings. Max insists that he isn't going to answer it. He can't. They just wait. Wait to see a dead hostage being thrown out of the building. 